Good morning, RPC family and friends. Happy Mother's Day. I'll be saying more about that in a moment. We're glad that you're here, and you'll also hear again that those beautiful flowers out there on those tables are for all the ladies of the church to take. Uh, if you're a mother, if you're not a mother, if you're a lady, you know who you are. You can take a, take a flower. And uh, the psalmist said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Uh, there are many reasons for us to be glad to be here today, to be together, to encourage one another, but also to worship, to worship the living God. And so I encourage you to join with me in this responsive call to worship in your bulletin. The Lord is good to all. All your works praise you, Lord. They tell of the glory of your kingdom, so that all people may know of your mighty acts. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises. Almighty God, we come into your presence today in need of your help even to praise you, Father, for our hearts and minds can be so easily distracted. Please help us, Lord, during this time to focus on the glorious things that you have done for each of us, giving us life and breath, giving us nourishment, giving us places to live, but most of all, in giving us the greatest gift of all, your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask that all that we say and sing and do during this hour would be pleasing to you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for our opening hymn.
As we confess our faith this morning, we'll look at the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer one. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. He has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Please remain standing as we worship the Lord.
Please be seated. We're flexible here at RPC, aren't we? Yes. And so we're changing the order of worship here. We're going to move our time of prayer up to this point, and you will see why in just a moment. But uh, you will have noticed quite a remarkable announcement in your bulletin this morning. I'm going to ask Jeremy and Janelle Labs if you would uh, come on up at this point. Along with Nathaniel, they have something they'd like to say to you. Very special Mother's Day for you, I think, huh? Morning, church family. We just wanted to take some time. Um, I'm going to get choked up because this is very emotional for us. But um, we were taken away by what you guys supported us through this process of allowing Nathaniel into our home. And it started this process. We felt like it was unachievable cost-wise, and I thought I just had to break my back and do everything on my own. And the call to worship um, was so touching because it is exactly what I forget, that we cannot do it without God. And I have had support from RPC. We've had support from Wheatland, which is a church I grew up with. And we have had support from Westminster, all just random notes in the mail from just saying we're praying for you and here's a little bit to help you with the cost. And it just got to be so overwhelming that God would choose to support us in this way that felt like our hardship and loss that we had to figure out. And it was just such a reminder that through God's grace and God's plan that he can give you life. And we just wanted to thank you for the overwhelming generosity. We, the piece that you guys, and along with Wheatland, supported us on was just about to the dollar of our entire adoption cost. And we are just so grateful. And being that it's Mother's Day, um, a year ago today, we had Faith Lynn in our home. And she had asked us that if, she, if we would adopt her. And months later, she ended up uh, being removed from our home. That was very hard for us. And uh, just short months later, uh, we had a different plan. And just been such a, a calling uh, that we felt so strongly about but didn't know how to do it. And I would just remind you that um, God knows your journey and he knows your plan. And even through the suffering... Uh, he's just not forgotten you just because it's hard. Uh, it's hard because he's reminding you that he's in control. <laughs> Thank you for loving us and supporting us. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to pray for you. Almighty God, uh, you are the one who does immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. We thank you so much for uh, the way you've blessed the Labs family and the way you've blessed our church family by having the opportunity and the privilege of being a part in uh, welcoming Nathaniel into their family and into our family. We pray your richest blessing upon them and thanking you for the way you've worked. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now we're not done quite yet. This is a time when we are going to recognize our mothers and why I do it this way, I don't know. But uh, asking the great-grandmothers to stand first, making them stand the longest. So great-grandmothers, and just you have to stay standing too. It's a test of your person perseverance here. So there's a great-grandmothers. You all look too young to be great-grandmothers, I tell you. Now all grandmothers, please. Moms and stepmoms. Janelle, isn't it great to be able to stand? And uh, any first-time expectant moms who would like to make news here this morning? <laughs> well, I just say, just remember, 
uh, please to, uh, to pick up your flowers on, on the way out, not just moms and, and grandmoms, great grandmoms, but all, all ladies. Let's say thanks to God for these special people. Now you may sit, and I will be glad to, to pray. Let's pray together. Almighty God, as we come into your presence today, we are indeed grateful for the remarkable blessings that you have poured down upon us. We thank you for enabling us to love one another so much. You've told us to love one another as you've loved us, and we fall far short of that, Lord. But thank you for the, the pictures we have of that here in our own body of believers. And we thank you as well that in our midst are those who have been moms and grandmoms and great-grandmoms. Father, we are, we're so thankful for them, thankful for the things that they have persevered through, grateful for the love that they have shown, asking, O oh Lord, that you would give them a perseverance and strength for, uh, for every single day that, that comes along. And we know uh, as well that this day is uh, a sad day for some whose relationships with our mothers may have not been ideal. Those who are thinking of their moms who are no longer with us. And uh, so we pray that you would bring uh, your comfort as well. Thinking of Chuck Felak this morning, whose, whose mom recently passed away, we pray for your your comfort for him and for his family and for the Rudder family and other family members so related. We are also grateful today that Don and Karen Yunt became grandparents again this weekend with the arrival of uh, Niall James Yunt. Please pray that you would be with him, pray that you would be with him and, and mom and keep them all safe and strong. And for our church family at, at large, we are grateful that next weekend we're able to celebrate our, our anniversary and pray that you would enable us to uh, be filled with joy in all that you have done and all that you're doing and all that you will do. And we ask for the Presbytery meeting on Saturday when Dr. Kiefer's terms of call will be approved by Presbytery. We pray that that would all go well. And for those who are facing uh, surgery this week, Lord, we pray for, for Chris Thomas. Lord, we pray for, um, for Judy Nowak. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that they are trusting in you. And uh, Father, uh, you have poured out every blessing upon us, and we ask that you would please be honored and praised now as we uh, give of our offerings and tithes to you. May they be pleasing to you. Thank you for hearing our prayers, for we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now receive this morning's tithes and offerings. To the teachers, caregivers, and parents of the children of RPC, you are more than spiritual babysitters and Christian entertainment for the church. You are some of the very first people to shepherd our children. We see you rocking babies, changing diapers, holding hands, wiping noses. We see you teaching lessons on blind men seeing, lame men walking, Zacchaeus climbing, and Father Abraham marching. We see you answering the difficult questions and guiding towards a future only God knows. You may, you may be the most hidden down the long hallways, but you are most seen by the Heavenly Father who welcomes the little children. You carry his heart and reflect his love to every soul. Thank you for being the gatekeepers of a new generation of sheep, instilling them in a deep love for Jesus. May you walk with authority and purpose as you lead our children to the feet of their Heavenly Father. At this point, we'll dismiss the children to children's worship, four years old to first grade. You can head out, and the rest of you take a moment to greet each other.
I need it. I need a tissue. Yeah, that's our. I'm. I'm live. I'm live. Oh, really? Did they? Are you sure? Thank you. Yes. I'm still on. And as you're being seated, just a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us for the first time. We're happy to have you here. If that's the case, uh, please pick up a uh, gift from our Welcome Center out there. It's a small notice of your presence. And uh, we're also distributing the registration books right now. If you let us know that you're here, we're so glad to, to have you here with us uh, this morning. And uh, yeah, next weekend uh, is going to be a very ex exciting weekend, in particular on uh, Sunday morning, I think. Uh, the banquet will be great. Uh, the plans have been well done. And at each of those events, you're going to be able to see the historic picture of, of all the pastors, past, present, and future of RPC. Uh, next Sunday morning, you'll see them all on this platform, which I think a very few churches have the opportunity to see. That's truly, truly a blessing. And uh, we're coming now to our final sermon in this series, To God Be the Glory, that was designed to bring glory to God and thanks to him for the fact that we've celebrated 40 years of history here at RPC. This is the 14th sermon in the series, and I've been thankful that uh, our guest preachers have been willing to uh, choose a psalm to carry on in the series, and I'm grateful for Anthony, who has partnered with me in this series. And uh, having preached on 14 of the psalms, that leaves 136 left. I mean, maybe, maybe Dr. Kiefer will pick up where we left off here. And we're going to look at Psalm 87 today, which I think is an appropriate way for us to end the series. It's requested by Laura, Laura Johnson. Thank you, Laura. And she said, I would like to request Psalm 87, if you still have room. Barely. <laughs> Seeing the board again concept in the Old Testament is exciting, as well as God welcoming all of us into his kingdom. Looking forward to it. And uh, let us now read Psalm 87 responsively. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. The Lord records as he registers the peoples. This one was born there. Let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your word, grateful for the Psalms that were given to us as ways to worship you, ways to learn about you, and again, pointers to Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray that you would bless our time uh, in Psalm 87 today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I think most of you will have recognized a, a, a key phrase there in Psalm 87. Glorious things of thee are spoken. And yes, of course, we're going to close our service by singing that hymn. 
But I think it gives us a, a good outline for the sermon as well. Because you can see, uh, if you're looking in your text, that there's a verse mark, a phrase mark after verse 3 and after verse 8. And I believe that the first phrase, the first stanza rather, talks about a glorious location. And then the second stanza talks about a glorious population. And the summary in the last verse is about a glorious celebration. So let's jump in uh, into, into this great, great psalm. Zion, the origin of the term itself is unknown but its definition is orderly, ordinarily identified with its location. The key here is that we're told that he founded it. He established it. Of all the places on earth, we're told that he founded this, and we'll see later that he loved it. In Joshua 15, there's an early reference to the slope of the Jebusites, that is Jerusalem. This was a strategic high ground in the area. Jerusalem was built on the highest ground in the region. And Zion would have been the rocky heights above the convergence of the Kidron and Hinnom valleys. And the city of Jerusalem would then be built north from that place over time. But in Judges 1, verse 21, we read, we read that the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem, so the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Now, if you're reading along in your five-day reading plan, uh, you would have read a couple of times this week about how this place of Zion developed in the time of David. In 1 Chronicles 11, after Saul's death and David's recognition by the people as their king, we read, David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, that is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land, the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, you will not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. And David lived in the stronghold, therefore it was called the city of David. Zion, the city of David, also Jerusalem. And the term Zion in the Old Testament, therefore came to be known most often to refer to the city that was built upon us upon it, and that is the city of Jerusalem. And what a remarkable, special place founded by God himself. This is where he established his meeting place with his people in the temple, the very picture of the presence of God, as well as a place where that which was necessary for them to have fellowship with God was placed, that was the altar, reminding them that access to God is through the shedding of blood, and later, Zion designated the temple area as well, which you see many other places in, in the scriptures. And so it's a place that he founded, but in verse 2 it says, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Now, we all have places that we love. I look at my family, they know the place that I love. Of course, I love my home, but I love a place in the mountains that I hope to get to next month. And it says the Lord loves the gates of Zion, the entry place. You know what it's like when you're on a long journey and you, you can see the destination in the future, in the, in the distance. Oh, well, I tell you, I can tell you every turn and curve and village before we get to Aunt Nettie's up in the mountains. And we turn that corner there it is. And so there's great joy. But even the love that I have for that, God, it says God loves the gates of Zion. And Psalm 78 is a psalm that details the, the faithfulness of God despite the rebelliousness of his people. It says in verse 68 that he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built a sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his, his inheritance. And here we see again the echoing of the fact that God loves Zion. He loves Judah. He loves Jerusalem. 
there's, ne there's a necessity that there be a place on the earth for God to love and God to set apart. Because it was going to be a place for the Messiah, as promised, to be born. Abram was promised that his offspring would be a blessing, not just to the families of Israel, but to the families of the whole earth. And the place is precious to God because it's the place where the ultimate expression of his love was expressed in the gift of his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's why the name Jerusalem means place or foundation of peace, of wholeness. Isn't that remarkable? The very city where God sent his son was the place where we would find wholeness in Christ. But there was a predecessor of that, if you will, on these very hills, you remember in Genesis chapter 22, where Isaac was told, excuse me, Abram was told to take his son Isaac and to offer him. And those were on the hills of Moriah. But we know that it says the Lord would provide when Isaac was spared. But it's on that very hill, we're told, that Solomon built the house of the Lord, built the temple the place of sacrifice, the same place. That's why the Lord loves it. That's why glorious things are spoken. Glorious things not merely about a, pop a location, but about a population. God not only had to choose a place, a sandy place along the Mediterranean Sea in which he would enter history to be our savior, but he also chose people chose people. He set aside people who would be his own possession. They would be the people through whom the Messiah would be born. When you look in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and the question is asked, well, why did God choose Israel? Well, God didn't choose Israel because they were the greatest in number, but he chose them because he loved them. He loved them. He loves Zion and he loves his people. And as a result, the people were told that they needed to be pure. They needed to be holy as God himself is holy. They needed to be set apart from the peoples of the nations. Why? So that there would be a people preserved through whom Messiah would be born. Not derailed by idolatry. And we understand that when you read the Old Testament. Yes, Israel is God's chosen people, but what's remarkable about this psalm? The heart of it comes next. Among those who know me, I mention, now in the Hebrew text, I mention comes first. It's like it's an announcement. I've got this big announcement to make. And what's the announcement? Okay, these are people who know me. Rahab and Babylon. Well, Rahab is an, an ancient term for Egypt. Well, now, knowing implies a, a loving relationship. Because I know Egypt. Okay, if you're going to make a list, folks, of people that are going to be beloved by God, Egypt is not going to be on the list. It's not going to be on the top of the list. It's Egypt who enslaved the people of God and almost extinguished them and would have if they could have, but they didn't. They couldn't because God preserved them. But here are the Egyptians. Well, not only that, if you had to, had to make a list, you certainly wouldn't put Babylon on there, would, would you? Now, Babylon comes really, really close to home because Babylon not only destroyed the city of Jerusalem, but also destroyed the temple and carried the people off into captivity. But we're told that Babylon is going to be there. What's going on here? Well, now we, get, now we get a little closer to home here. We talk about Philistia. Philistines. Thumbs up or thumbs down when you hear the word Philistines? That's right, thumbs down. They were a pain to the Israelites forever. Goliath was a Philistine, 
And uh, the Philistines were always nipping at their ankles and worse. And the Philistines, actually, after David became king, was anointed king, it was the Philistines he had to do battle with right away. But here they are. Egyptians, Babylonians, Philistines, Tyre, Tyre. If you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll find three chapters in there that are condemning Tyre. Because when, when, the, when Jerusalem was carried away and destroyed, Tyre laughed. Tyre enjoyed it. The Tyre was very powerful shipping city on the coast of uh, the Mediterranean coast in uh, what is now Lebanon. But do you see what the psalmist is doing here? He's giving us a picture of a total geographic inclusion because you've got Tyre to the north, you have Egypt to the south, you have Babylon to the east, and Philistia to the west. It reminds me of Psalm 107, where it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has called to himself from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Then he says, just to throw another one in, Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia would be a distant, a distant land to the south, as you know, in Africa. So here in this remarkable psalm, we have the picture of the expansion of the mission of God to include non-Jews. There are pictures of this many times in the Old Testament. You know as you read, particularly the prophets, as you see those predictions. But the inclusion of non-Jews didn't come easy, did it? Even though, even though from the very beginning, you have the Magi coming from the east to worship the newborn king. In the life and ministry of Jesus, you see him reaching out to, to non-Jews. We see him healing the servant of a centurion. We see him reaching out to the Samaritan woman. And uh, did this, when the disciples saw Jesus with the Samaritan woman, did they go, Oh, this is really good. No, they didn't. They said, what in the world is he doing? But Jesus makes it clear. He makes it clear, not only in his ministry, but also in his commission, that we're to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when the promise of the Spirit is given, the promise is given that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my ambassadors to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. There it is again and again. And the book of Acts. I, I have a lot of questions. You think you've got questions? I've got questions when I get to heaven. I want to know where the Ethiopian eunuch got the copy of uh, Isaiah. So we read in the book of Acts that there's an Ethiopian who's sitting in his chariot reading a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Where did he get that, Lord? I don't know. But Philip comes along, and uh, uh, the Ethiopian says, Hey, uh, do you know who this is talking about? What, 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 are, what are you reading? So it says, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The Ethiopian asked, who is this about? And then we were told that he preached Jesus to him from the scriptures. He preached Jesus to him from the scriptures. So there's already the Ethiopian contingent. But this inclusion of non-Jews was, was difficult. You remember what Peter had to go through. Peter had to go through uh, a vision uh, where the angel lowered uh, a sheet or a blanket that had uh, unclean animals on it and it said, take and eat. Peter said, I can't take what is unholy. And then a knock comes at the door. It's from this centurion named Cornelius. 
So he goes to see uh, Cornelius, and Cornelius says, I had this vision that uh, I needed to talk to you. What do you have to say? And what's, what did, what's Peter's response? He says, now I know that God's blessing is not merely to Jews, but also is to include the Gentiles as well. Now, the apostles were told in chapter 11 of Acts, apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. But there were still people who didn't get it. So Peter had to go. <clears throat> Next Saturday, we're going to Presbytery meeting. <clears throat> Here in the book of, uh, of Acts, we have perhaps one of the first Presbytery meetings ever. And they are discussing <clears throat> this whole matter of the Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And Peter has to explain the whole thing. And their response? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. But old habits die hard. You remember the book of Galatians? We're told that Peter used to eat with Gentiles until the people from Jerusalem showed up and he decided to set, up, set himself apart according to the, uh, the newly developed dietary laws by the rabbinical class. And Paul had to ream him out. he say, what are you doing? You know that they are welcome into the kingdom as you are by the gospel. And Paul makes the point very clearly in Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to this. Verses 11 and following. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So in making peace, he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation. There it is, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, why do I read that whole text? Because it talks about the fact that not only is the wall of hostility broken down, that it's the gospel is going to all people, but now there has been a convergence of the place and the people of God. We are now part of the church, the new Jerusalem, the new Zion, which is built on the foundation of the apostles with Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. I think Phil Riken put it well when he said, the family of God is ethnically and culturally diverse. As Christians, we not only permit such diversity, but we cherish it. This is because God himself cherishes ethnic diversity. He is not colorblind, he is colorful. At his throne, God welcomes worshipers from every nation, tribe, people, and language. His plan of redemption is for the peoples of the world and all their rich variety. And the exciting thing is that right here in this room, we see the fulfillment of that. Non-Jews who've come to faith in Jesus Christ. The fulfillment of the prophecy. But how is this going to happen? He goes on to say, this one was born there, they say. And of Zion, it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her, for the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the peoples, this one was born there. Well, now what is he saying? Is he saying that, well, 
Everybody who's going to be part of the kingdom of God is going to be born in Jerusalem? No. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that that which makes people citizens of the heavenly Zion is being born again. Experiencing a new birth into the new Zion, into the new city of God. Even as Jesus answered the religious leader, he said, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And literally, that means born from above. John's first chapter we read, To all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God's initiative. And why does God extend this regenerating love into our hearts? Because he loves you. John Calvin comments here that although Zion was not the place of their natural birth, they were to be grafted into the body of the holy people by adoption. Yet as they, as the way by which we enter into the church is a second birth. And as Paul writes to Titus, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done, but in accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And we need a new birth. We need a spiritual birth because we're born dead in sin. And remarkably, I think you will have noticed that was a psalm of the sons of Korah. Now, when I mention the sons of Korah, you know, some lights should go on. Do you remember Dathan and Abiram and Korah? Remember, back in the Old Testament in the wilderness, they rose up against Moses. And they said, you're not better than we are. And Moses says, well, look, why don't we let God decide? God will show you who is greater or who is to be the leader. And if God doesn't do something extraordinary, then we won't pay attention. But I'm going to ask God to do something extraordinary so that it will be shown for real that who his leader is. So the next morning, Dathan, Abiram, and Korah were standing in front of their tents. And do you remember what happened? Well, it was something extraordinary that you don't see every day. The earth opened up and swallowed them up. And then the earth closed back over them again. I'd say the point was made quite well. But then, who are these? Who are these sons of Korah? Well, they're a testimony of God's grace because also later in the book of Numbers, it says the sons of Korah did not die. And so their very existence to give praise to God is evidence of, of the grace of God. And the very existence of the church and the people of God is evidence of the grace and mercy of God because if it were... If we're based on our own goodness, we deserve for the earth to open up and swallow us up. But no, God sent his son into the world, through that people, into that land. And now the place is the people. You see a reference to the book of life. In Hebrews chapter 12, we see these ideas coming together. You have come to Mount Zion, speaking to the people of God, to the city of the loving, living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. And I think you can see can, this convergence of the people and the place of God when you come to the book of Revelation. Because there we're introduced to the heavenly Zion, the heavenly city. And we're told in chapter 21 it had a high wall with 12 gates. And the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of Israel inscribed. And on the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. On them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. There you have those represent representatives of the people of God of all ages. 
there as the city of God, the foundation and the gates of the city of God. But also you see the people here. You know the significance of, of 12 in the book of Revelation. And earlier in the book, we have this picture of people standing on Mount Zion, standing before the Lamb. There are 144,000 of them. And we know that that number is symbolic as well because you have the 12 as a representative of the old covenant leadership and 12 as a representative of the new covenant leadership. Multiply together 144 times the number of completion, the 144,000. But then later we see a literary figure that John uses where he hears something and then he turns and he looks. So in the first chapter he hears told of the lamb, but then he turns and he sees this remarkable picture of the glorious Christ. And here in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, he hears something and he turns to see the reality. He hears about the 144,000 and he says, I turned, I looked, and I saw a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb. All the people for all generations who have trusted in Jesus Christ are going to be there. We are the new Jerusalem. We are the new Zion. And so what does that lead to? A glorious location, a glorious population. It has to lead to a glorious celebration, doesn't it? That's what we see in the book of Revelation. That's what we see here, verse 7. Singers and dancers alike say, all my springs are in you. And there's no clear picture of celebration in the New Testament than, and the Old Testament together than singing and dancing. Celebration is what's required. Rejoicing is what's required. And there's a reference here to springs. There's a spring uh, in Zion called Gion. And it's likely that one of the reasons that David settled there was because of that spring, of a source of water in that dry place. And Psalm 84 was another psalm that was written by the Korahites. And it talks about them being away from Zion, but in whose hearts are highways to Zion. It says they're ever longing to be home, but in the meantime, in their pilgrimage, they make the dry valley springs, a place of springs. And so it is for us. We've been given the privilege of being called to be part of the people of God, the glorious church, the beloved bride of Christ. And we've also been promised that springs of water would flow from us. Jesus promised, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And we said this about the spirit whom those who believed in were to receive. And so if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have received the gift of the Spirit and flowing springs of water coming out of your heart and life to make the dry places prosper. And I can tell you that being a part of the body of Christ, the beloved New Jerusalem, his church, is truly a glorious thing to experience. Because in our very midst, we've seen dry places of life challenging places of life, blessed by the body of believers, producing springs of water. And in Psalm 84, it says, they go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. So it's a wonderful psalm to end our short series on, um, to God be the glory here to celebrate our 40th birthday. But just remember these couple of things. You are loved by God. You are part of his church, the new Zion. We are the fulfillment of this psalm as non-Jews coming to faith in Christ. And now we're part of the mission to reach others. And though we were dead in our sins, we have been born again, born from above by God's grace. And we can rejoice that every day we have the resource of the Spirit of God to help us along the way, for it says, everyone will finish, everyone will see the gates of Zion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, thank you so much 
for the opportunity that we have had to study the Psalms, some Psalms, and uh, we're grateful that you have brought us into the glorious people of God, which is your beloved church. And we thank you that you that thank you that we are the continuation of that uh, remarkable uh, people of God established from of old. And we look forward, our God, to standing uh, around your throne one day, worshiping you and, and praising you with peoples of every tongue, nation, and tribe. And would you fill us with your spirit uh, as a congregation as we uh, consider what you would have next for us in the next years of our history? Uh, help us, Lord, to be those who have an expansive view, giving the opportunity for whosoever will believe to have eternal life through faith in Jesus. And it's his name we pray, amen. Please stand. Please receive these words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated just for a moment. Ladies, don't forget to pick up your flowers. I just want you to know 
that uh, Herb and the deacons, they got notepads to go with these flowers. And I hope you'll notice that the notepads actually match the flower. Yes, very, very impressive. So don't forget that. And thank you, Herb and friends, for, for all that. We have a lost and found here in the Narthex classroom. And uh, the announcement says we want to unclutter a bit before the anniversary. Take a peek and claim your belongings. We're getting ready for company, so let's clear things up, friends. So anniversary weekend is next weekend. Just a reminder, please invite your friends and neighbors to this historic celebration, especially of the service. Uh, Kingdom Kids Registration, use the QR code in the bulletin to register your children online. That's all. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. Thank you.